John chapter 8, beginning in verse 21, the Bible says, Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whether I go, ye cannot come. He said unto them, Ye are from beneath, and I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. Speaking of his deity, Jesus Christ is God. I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. Ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Do you notice the urgency of the Lord Jesus speaking to these scribes and Pharisees? He mentions three times in this passage of Scripture, that if you do not believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Ye shall die in your sins. This is important to the heart of the Savior. And we're going to look at it this morning as we consider this thought, that if ye shall not believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Let's pray together. Father, I pray you'd help us this morning as we have taken this time in our service to look at your word. And Father, I pray you would help us to examine it correctly. Father, we want to know the truth. It is the truth that will make us to be free. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would speak to hearts. I pray, Father, that all of us leaving this room this, this morning would know 100% sure that we have a salvation in the Bible and God, a true salvation, and we can sing, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I pray, Father, in heaven that you lead and direct us. We pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Bible says in this passage of Scripture, verse 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, then ye shall die in your sins. I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As we've been walking through the Gospel of John, I've been looking at the next verses of this passage of Scripture, and I was considering changing the message for a Thanksgiving sermon. But the Lord wouldn't allow me to do it. We can be thankful for our salvation. Amen. I think that's a wonderful thing. And we find in this passage of Scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching salvation. He's preaching to these Pharisees that they must come to Him to be saved. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul the Apostle writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, of course, he says, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible teaches us as we compare Scripture with Scripture that there is a decision to be made. As humanity, we can die in our sins and spend an eternity separated from God paying for those sins. Or we can accept the payment that Jesus Christ died for those sins. And that is what the Bible teaches us. The choice is ours to make. And here in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is beseeching these Pharisees. You must believe that I am the Christ, the one who paid your sin debt, or you will die in your sins. This is a serious thing. Three times he tells them, you'll die in your sins. You'll die in your sins. You'll die in your sins. Your sin debt must be paid. I read the story of a small boy who was constantly uh, late coming home from school. His parents warned him one day that he must be home on time that afternoon, but nevertheless, that child was the latest that he's ever come home. He came to the front door. His mother met him at the door and said nothing. And at dinner that night, the boy looked at his plate, and there was a slice of bread and a glass of water. That was all. He looked at his dad's plate, his full plate. He 
asked his father, and his father remained silent. The boy was crushed. The father waited for the full impact to seek in, and then quietly and quickly he took the boy's plate, placed it in front of himself, and he took his own plate of meat and potatoes, put it in front of the small boy, and he smiled at his son. The boy said as he grew to be a man, he said, all of my life I've known what God is like by what my father did to me that night. And that is truly salvation. When we sing, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, we are thanking the Lord for taking our place. You see, he took the cross. We deserve the cross. He died for our sin. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. He took the cup, the bitter cup of death, so that we could know God and have a place in heaven for us. That is eternal life. That is salvation. Someone has penned Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior, turned away God's wrath forever. By his, better, uh, by his better grief and woe, he saved us from the evil foe. Christ has come, all ye that labor, and receive my grace and favor. They who feel no want or ill need no physician's help or skill. As his pledge of love undying, for his precious food supplying gives his body with the bread and with the wine and blood he shed. Praise the Father who from heaven unto us such food hath given and to mend what we have done. God unto death his only Son. If thine heart this truth professes and thy mouth thy sin confesses, his dear guest thou here shall be, and Christ himself shall banquet thee. In order for us to understand this passage of Scripture in John chapter 8, when Jesus is beseeching these Pharisees, you shall die in your sin, you shall die in your sin, we have to open the Bible as a whole. And we have to understand the truth of what God is talking to, ta speaking about, and what God is speaking to us about our condition. I want us to notice, if you're taking notes this morning, write it down, the debt of sin. The debt of sin. You see, sin has a finished consequence. You say, Pastor Burns, what do you mean? Turn with me to the book of James, if you would. We're looking at what the Bible says. This is not our opinion. This is what the Bible says. And we're looking at various scriptures to prove it. The Bible says in James chapter 1, would you turn there? James chapter 1, it's wonderful to hear the pages of the Bible turning. You know, a lot of churches, you don't hear that. James chapter 1, look what the Word of God has to say. We'll begin our reading in the 13th verse. James chapter 1, verse 13. The Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The Bible says that the finished consequence of our sin is death. We can dress it up. We can ignore it like a lot of people do today. But the reality is, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the Bible says, for by one man, Adam's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, because the finished consequence of our sin is death. And the reality is that everyone in this room will die one day because we are all sinners. The finished consequence, when sin is completed, the Bible says it bringeth forth death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. The end result of sin is death. Sin brings death. And we're all guilty of sin. That's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 3, verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may be guilty before God. We're all guilty before God. We've all sinned. And the Bible says that the finished consequence of our sin is death. I mean, look through the Bible. Look through the Word of God. And you read about wonderful men of God 
men who made good decisions, men who made bad decisions. But when you read about their life, you read about their end. And their end was death. The Bible tells us in Genesis 5, verse 5, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. And he died. <laughs> Genesis 5, verse 8, and all the days of Seth were 912 years. And he died. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, these all died in, in faith. Death is the finished consequence of our sin. But not only do we notice the finished consequence, there's also a fearful conclusion. Now, look what the Bible says in John chapter 8. I don't want you to miss this. Let's go back to our text, the 8th chapter, the book of John, and notice what the Bible says in verse 21. John chapter 8 and verse 21. The Bible says this, verse 21, Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. And whether I go, ye cannot come. Strong words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I go my way, I leave you, ye shall die in your sins. And where I go, Jesus said, ye cannot come. Not you may come, not a hope so. Not, well, we're going we're gonna to take all of your good and all your bad and put in the giant scale of life and see which way it tilts. No, he says, you cannot come. Where I go, you cannot come. I want you to turn to the very last book of our Bible, the book of Revelation. This was the last plea of the God of heaven for humanity to come to Christ. In Genesis, or in, excuse me, in the book of Revelation, the 21st verse, I want us to notice what the Bible says in verse 27. Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. The Bible says this in verse 20, uh, chapter 21, verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter anything that defileth. This is speaking of heaven. The Bible says, and there shall in no wise enter in, into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Nothing is going to enter into the presence of Almighty God. Nothing that is defiled. That's what the Bible says. Nothing that worketh an abomination. Nothing that maketh a lie. Let me ask you this question this morning. Let's be honest this morning. Have you ever told a lie? Even a small one? If you say, I've never told a lie, guess what? You just did. <laughs> we have a problem. The Bible tells us that our finished consequence is death. We understand that that is a physical death and a spiritual death. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that nothing is going to enter into the presence of God, nothing that defileth, nothing that worketh an abomination, nothing that even maketh a lie, nothing will enter into the presence of Almighty God. And the Bible tells us that there is a physical death, there's no doubt about it, we see that every day, but also there is a spiritual death which People don't want to think about. People don't want to believe. But the Bible tells us it's true. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, they were cast into the lake of fire. There is a heaven to gain, but there's a hell to shun. And that is what the Bible teaches us. And in John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus Christ, a broken-hearted Savior, said, He tells them in this passage of Scripture, I said, therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins, if ye believe not that I am He, the Christ. Ye shall die in your sins. That is the Lord Jesus Christ pleading with the people. The reality is that nothing can enter into heaven that defileth or maketh an abomination, or maketh a lie. Because of our sin, we are separated from the presence of Almighty God. I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews. If you turn there, the book of Hebrews. You shall die in your sins. This is a big deal. This is a big problem for all of humanity. And the Word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. I don't want you to miss this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. The Bible says this, 
the verse, 27th verse, And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, this is death, after death, the end. Life no more, right? What well, the world wants us to believe, but God says no, after this, the judgment. You say, Pastor Burns, the judgment of what? It is the judgment of your sin. And Jesus said in this passage of Scripture that if you die in your sin, you cannot come to where I am. There's a debt that has to be paid. There's a debt that we have upon all of humanity for all have sinned and we've come short of the glory of God and you can live a hundred lifetimes being a good person and joining every church and, and being baptized a million times, but you could never reach God's standard of perfection. We have a big problem. We have a debt that we cannot pay. The Bible tells us that the law of God was not given to help you. It wasn't for you to pat yourself on the back saying, I'm not that bad of a person, but God gave us the Ten Commandments to prove to you that you are guilty before God. And you have this problem, and, and you have this debt upon your shoulder. That's why David said, my sin is ever before me. He could not escape the fact that there was a debt upon him. How would we pay this debt? How can we go to heaven? How can we know the Lord? Well, there's the debt of sin. But I'm happy to tell you this morning, there's the deliverance from sin. I want you to turn to the book of Romans, if you turn there, the sixth chapter. This is a wonderful chapter, Romans chapter 6. And I love taking passages of Scripture that we love. Verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. I love looking at the context of it because I believe we miss a great deal of biblical truth by pulling verses from contexts and using them for every area of our life. God has a purpose in the verses that he pens. And then in John, in, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 6, the Bible says in eight, the 18th verse, being made free from sin. Now let me ask you this question. If you owed $1 million to a company or a business or an individual, and that debt was ever before you, I mean, every day you woke up, that debt was always before your eyes. You didn't know how you were going to pay that debt. It was an amount of money that you could never pay. And someone came to you and said to you that you can be free from that debt. Wouldn't you listen? Of course you would. Let's not be silly this morning. You'd listen. You'd be attentive. You'd want to know how you can be free from debt. We have a debt of sin upon our shoulders. We cannot enter into the presence of God. We've broken God's law. We are guilty before God. Our mouth is stopped. All of the world is guilty. And here in the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, says you can be free from sin. This is a big deal. This is something we need to listen. This, is, this ought to get our attention. This, this ought to push away from our mind all of the busyness of our life. I want to be free from sin. I want my debt to be paid. So what do I do? Look what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the iniquity and uh, infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants unto uncleanness or servants unto sin and to iniquity unto iniquity, sin after sin, it is the life of human beings, sin after sin. Even so now, yield your members, servants unto righteousness, unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were freed from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The end of sin is death. We talked about that. An individual who is living their life without God, living for the pleasures of this world, living their life sin after sin, no concept that their sin is going to bring death, no understanding that their sin will separate them from God, and they're loving their sin, and they're enjoying their sin. That's why the Bible says in chapter 3 that people don't come to the light because they love their darkness, and they want their darkness, and they want iniquity, but they don't understand that they are condemned already on their way to hell. And they're living their life with smiles on their faces, enjoying the pleasures of this world, and yet the Bible says it's only for a season. 
And they must come to the reality that they'll stand before a holy God that demands absolute perfection and they've broken God's law and they're undone and they're unclean and they cannot in their own ability save themselves and they have a debt that they cannot pay. The Bible tells us in this passage of Scripture that they will come to the reality that the end of their sin brings death. Separation from God forever is a serious thing. But the Bible says in verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end of it is everlasting life. And the end of it is to know the joys of God. And the end of it is to have God in this world and to pray and God to hear us when we pray and God to be in the ship of our life and to direct us and to lead us. That is the end of righteousness. But how do I become righteous? I'm undone. I'm a sinner. How, how do I become perfect and clean if I am a sinner? Well, that's why the Bible tells us in the book of Corinthians that he took our sin upon him. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And I know I say this a lot, but I can't help to be excited that when God looks at a Christian, He doesn't see that which defileth. He doesn't see that which maketh an abomination. He doesn't see that which maketh a lie. He doesn't see the one who lives in sin after sin but he sees his son, and we are declared righteous in Jesus Christ. And that is a wonderful thing. That is something to be thankful when the God of heaven, who demands absolute perfection, looks at the child of God by grace, activated by faith. He sees his only begotten son. He died on the cross and bled and died on the cross so that we could have everlasting life. Friend today, Jesus died for you. He died for you and he died as you. He took your place. They say when Lincoln's body was brought from Washington to Illinois, it passed through Albany. And as it was carried through the streets, they say a, a, a woman, a black woman, stood upon the curb, he lifted her son as high as she could above the crowds. She said to him, son, take a long look. Because that man died for you. And I want you to pause in the busyness of your day, the busyness of a Thanksgiving weekend. I want you to take a long look of the Savior who bled and died. I want you to take a long look this morning of the Redeemer who was nailed to a cross and, and, and faced a, a, an unfair trial, was put to death for doing that which was right. The perfect Lamb of God. I want you to take a long look at the Savior who gave His life for you. He died for you. When humanity couldn't pay that debt, when humanity was lost and undone, Jesus reached down and the Bible says He died on the cross and He said, I'll pay their debt. I'll take their place. And that's why on the cross of Calvary, he said, it's finished. It's paid in full. The debt is paid. Mankind can come to God. Mankind can have salvation. It is finished. It's done. And friend, today when the world adds things to salvation, they cheapen the fact that Jesus Christ is the only way. He bled and died for our sin. I love what the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thine heart that God has raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. He washed our sins away. He paid our sin debt. 
He took our place. This is the debt of sin. This is the deliverance from sin. But I want us to notice, if we could, thirdly, the decision to be free from sin, because the decision is yours. You must choose the Lord. Look what the Bible says, if we could go back to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Look what the Bible says when the God of heaven, when the God of heaven finished his book, he gave one final appeal to humanity to come. To come. To come to Christ. To believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who paid your debt, or you shall die in your sins. It is the final plea from the God of heaven. And he penned in verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that believeth say, Come. And let him that is of thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. It is the invitation for all. Whosoever. Whosoever. The invitation for those to come. Why? Because of sin, we are separated from God. How? Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. He, he paid our sin debt. And the Bible says to come. It is the decision to be free from sin. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, listen, friend, I would be saved for you if I could. <laughs> Christian life is the wonderful Christian life. People look at the Christian life and say, oh, listen, all you do is this and that. Listen, the Christian life is wonderful. It's wonderful to know that you are free from the debt of sin, that Jesus is your Savior, and that He lives with inside you, and He's leading you and guiding you. It is a wonderful thing to be a child of God, and I can truly sing from my heart, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And if I could be a Christian for you, I would do it a hundred times. But it's a decision you have to make. It's a choice that you need to make. The decision to know Christ. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Jesus said in John chapter 8, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, Christ, then ye shall die in your sins. Because there's a debt you cannot pay. There's a Savior who loved you so much, He went to a cross and paid your debt. The Bible says that whosoever would recognize the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that you cannot pay your debt on earth in any way, that it's only through the Lord. The Bible says that His sin, though it was upon Him on the cross, His righteousness will be upon you that moment you believe, and you will be declared righteous in the sight of Almighty God. Your sin will be gone, and you can say, as the prophet in Micah said, my sin is buried in the deepest sea. It is separated as far as the east is from the west, and God remembers it no more, not because God cannot remember it. He is God. He is all-knowing. But because God chooses not to remember it, it is gone. The Bible says it's washed away in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ book of Revelation tells us. And friend, today you can know that you're going to heaven. As I sat down on Saturday in discipleship and told individuals, they can know that heaven is your home. And to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Not something you hope, not something it's a maybe. It's something that you know. You can know today that heaven is your home. You can know today that your sin is washed away. Someone said to every man there openeth a way and ways and a way. And some men climb the highway and some men group below. And in between on the misty flats the rest drift to and fro. And to every man there openeth a highway and a low. And every man decideth which way his soul will go. I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, if we could, as we close. Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to read again what the Lord Jesus says in the book of Matthew in the 7th chapter. 
Matthew chapter 7. And notice what the Bible says in verse 13. The Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in therein. Because straight is the gate, verse 14, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then the Bible says in verse 15, to beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. And they stand before people and they say, oh, there's many ways to heaven. There's many ways to God. You're taking one way and I'm taking another way and we'll just end at the same place. He said, beware of false teachers that they come to you as angels of light. He says, no, there's only one way. It's a narrow way. And there's not a lot of people that find it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way. And friend, today, I want you to understand, as the Lord Jesus Christ is standing before the Pharisees, three times He said, you'll die in your sins. You'll die in your sins. You'll die in your sins. This is a big deal. Because to die in your sins means that for all eternity you will pay for those sins. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I've come to pay that debt. Why would you die in your sins when the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sin? Amen. Would you come to Christ today? Would you come to Christ today? Christian, we can be thankful for a wonderful salvation. He paid a debt I could never pay. And now I'm on my way to heaven. That's a wonderful thing. Let's thank Him for it, the wonderful salvation we have. Let's pray together, can we? Father in heaven, we thank You, Lord, for Your Word and for its truth and its power. And Heavenly Father, I pray that You would help us to understand this truth. We, we understand that the devil is a roaring lion. He's walking about seeking whom he may devour. He has an army of false teachers. He's blinded the minds of them which believe not lest they see the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I pray, Father in heaven, that you would remove that darkness. I pray that you'd remove that blindness. And I pray, Father in heaven, if there's an individual that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Father in heaven, we don't know how long we have on this earth. And I beg you, Lord, that they would not die in their sin that they would accept the payment for their sin in Jesus Christ and be in Christ and be robed in righteousness and stand before you declared righteous. Oh God, I pray that they'd be saved. And Father, I pray that as Christians that we would be a people of thanksgiving, that we would thank you for our salvation, that we would not take it for granted. But Father, I pray that we would have this attitude of praise that we had a debt that we could never pay. But Father, you cried on the cross, it's finished, it's paid in full. And Father, we thank you for it. I pray, Lord, that you would have your way in this invitation. Help us to make good decisions this morning. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking around. Let's stand to our feet if we could for just a moment. As the piano plays, if God has spoken to your heart, maybe you want to come to this altar and thank the Lord for the salvation that you have and boldness to spread that salvation to others. Would you come this morning? Would you thank him on this wonderful Thanksgiving morning? Would you thank him for that wonderful salvation? If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you have doubts about it or wherever you are in your, Christian, or in your life, we want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you and died for you. He wants you to go to heaven with him. You say, Pastor Burns, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I'm concerned about it. I want you to pray for me. 
would you just lift your hand? I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call out your name or come to where you are. But you'd say, Pastor Burns, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I'm concerned about it. Would you just slip up your hand quickly, quietly? Is there anyone like that at all? Anyone at all? I don't know if I'm a Christian. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I'm concerned about it. Would you slip up your hand? Is there anyone anywhere? I don't know if I'm a Christian this morning. Anyone anywhere? You say, Pastor Burns, I am a Christian. And the message.